the Harvard Graduate School of Education, working at the nexus of practice, policy, and research. Good afternoon. Thank you for your patience while we're getting ourselves organized. I'm Bob Schwartz, an academic dean here. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this uh, very special Ask With Forum, and it's a particular pleasure to welcome Randy Weingarten to the Graduate School of Education. Um, this institution and several of us on this faculty have a long-standing relationship uh, with the AFT, especially with its uh, late legendary uh, leader, uh, Al Shanker, who, um, among other things, actually spent a couple of years uh, teaching here uh, while he was uh, leading that organization. Um, I want to step out of my ceremonial academic dean role and uh, just say uh, a quick word or two, really based on some of the international policy work that I've been doing over the last uh, couple of years, um, really just two observations. Um, the first is that, uh, to my knowledge, uh, there is no high-performing country uh, that has been able to achieve sustained uh, high performance uh, without having invested in a highly professional um, uh, teaching force. And the second observation is that almost all high-performing countries with highly professional teaching forces also have very strong teachers' unions. Um, teachers' unions that in some countries, uh, like Finland, represent all educators, uh, kindergarten through, through higher education. Um, so for those who think that strong unions and strong educational performance uh, can't coexist, think again and look at the international evidence. Uh, it's my real pleasure to introduce my colleague and friend, Susan Moore Johnson, who uh, among the people on this faculty is really the person who's had the closest working relationship uh, with teacher organizations uh, and especially um, with the AFT. Susan. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be able to welcome Randy. Um, a couple um, rules here. We're going to have the Q&A uh, after Randy talks. We'd like you, you, I know you got index cards coming in. Um, put your questions on the cards. Send them to the two main aisles, not to the outside aisle. Um, we'll uh, pick them up. Someone else will. Um, raise your hand if you need a card, and we'll make sure you get one. And um, then we, at the end of uh, Randy's talk, we will collect them all, and we'll answer, ask her to answer as many um, as, as we can. OK? So um, I'm really pleased to be introducing uh, Randy Weingarten, president of the American Federation of Teachers, or the AFT, as we say all as if it's one long uh, syllable. Uh, in March 1980, when some of you were barely born, I was still a doctoral student, and I had the honor of introducing Albert Schenker, who was president of the AFT at a forum just like this in this same hall. Um, part of re the reason I was given that honor at the time was that people in 1980 didn't, outside of, uh, you know, or here, didn't know a lot about who Al Schenker was. And to the extent that faculty and students knew about him, um, they knew him as a labor leader, not the educational reformer that he would become in the 1980s. And that night, Al delivered a speech about educational governance, which I pulled out in all of its white out and type over um, old style kind of uh, speech writing. Uh, and as always, he was prescient at that time. He anticipated many of the issues of today. Uh, he predicted the emergence of educational organizations that would be financed but not regulated by the government. He warned of tuition tax credits and what he called voucher schools. He wondered, what will education or our society be like 15 or 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years from now with the alternative institutions that are now being proposed? So here we are 31 years later, and we're trying to answer and make sense of those questions um, today. Randy Weingarten, like her predecessor, and I think in some ways her mentor, uh, Al Shanker, is both an effective union leader and an influential educational reformer. And I will tell you, those two do not always appear in the same individual. 
Uh, Lorraine McDonald, who's a scholar of unionism, said to me recently, Randy's taken a page from Al's playbook. And I think, uh, I think many of us would agree. Randy holds a degree from Cornell in labor relations and a law degree from Cardozo Law School. She taught history in Brooklyn's Crown Heights for six years before moving into full-time union leadership. Uh, for 12 years, she served as the president of the United Federation of Teachers in New York City. And since 2008, she served as president of the National AFT. For part of that time, she was president of both and, and lived on an airplane. Um, some, some of you, perhaps many, uh, may think that the president of a national teachers union has a whole lot of formal authority. Um, <laughs> that would be true in many other countries, but it's not true in the United States, where local contracts are bargained by local parties, and neither the state nor the national affiliate has the authority to dictate the terms of the agreement. So although Randy's formal authority, even though she's the president of the AFT, is limited, her potential for leadership is not, and that's what she understands. In the past three years, um, her effects and her proposals uh, and the attention to those proposals have been far-reaching. In 2009, in a key address at the National Press Club, she announced that nothing should be on, off the table. Um, and that got a lot of attention. In 2010, she solicited the assistance of Ken Feinberg, who set it up the process for um, providing compensation after 9-11 and Katrina. And he worked to devise um, with uh, the union, but, but he was the prime designer of this, a plan for expedited review of teachers who are charged with serious misconduct, those in the so-called rubber room, which I think Many people heard that, read The New Yorker, and talk about it. I, this is to deal with those folks. Then uh, last month, actually it's, yeah, still last month, Randy proposed a plan for the assistance, review, and possible dismissal of tenured teachers who receive poor performance evaluations. Um, it would assure due process, it would provide assistance, but it would last no more than the year. She has promoted educational reforms by creating the AFT's Innovation Fund, which provides grant to local labor management teams who engage in substantial progressive change. Uh, most recently, she made her case about the rightful role of teachers in reform as a representative, representative of the US team at the International Summit on Education that was organized by Arne Duncan. Uh, for those of you who may not think that any of this is notable. She recently was a guest of Stephen Colbert on the Colbert <laughs> Report. And finally, because we're all here at HDSC tonight, I must also say how impressed I have been by Randy's genuine interest in research and its implications for policy and practice. So I know we're in for a treat. I welcome you, Randy Weingart. So I'm interested in research because I wish I could do it myself. Um, thank you, Susan, very much. And I wanted to thank Bob um, as well. Um, it is quite an honor um, for a labor leader and for an educator to be in the halls of Harvard. This place has um, not only an amazing reputation, but the, um, the ability for those of us who represent working folk to talk to people who think about issues all the time and whose views on issues are viewed um, favorably by the world. It is really quite an honor and so I have had the um, fun time all day of being with lots of students today, um, but it is a particular honor to be at Asquith Forum. And I am told that the forums are not just a tribute to Herbert Asquith, but he was 
from my old haunting ground, New York City. <laughs> so I'm going to be a little wonky tonight um, and talk to you about our theory of change, um, a theory to transform, I hope, a system of public schools into the system that meets the needs of all children in the 21st century global economy. And I am looking forward to your questions. But first, I want to say something personal. And it has something to do with a purple suit. Now, I am wearing crimson today, if you noticed. <laughs> when I was in Wisconsin, I did try to wear red, um, which is also the color of Cornell, so it's easy. Um, but what I saw a cartoon, and when I did the podcast earlier, I did say that one of my favorite books was The Adventures of Cavalier and Clay. So I saw a cartoon earlier this week, or a caricature earlier this week of me, and normally I don't pay attention to these things because I get them all the time. But this one was um, raised a bunch of issues with me, one that will totally surprise you. This one was Michelle Rhee, a superwoman. I don't know if people saw this. It went quite viral. Holding up a bus with kids. And it had me pulling her down with kryptonite in one of my hands, wearing a purple pantsuit. <laughs> now, I do wear pantsuits all the time. Now, there was one thing I could relate to in this story, which was the purple suit. Now, you wonder, why? And what it actually did was it took me back to teaching at Clara Barton High School when I used to wear suits all the time. But I wore skirt suits, not pantsuits. And I had a purple skirt suit. It did have to be actually go to Salvation Army after a while because the chalk dust, which I had every single day in my pockets, kind of ruined that suit as well as others. But this is what it reminded me of. The kids in my class, and this was a particular street law class, they used to love that purple suit, and particularly the girls in my class. And they would be, they asked me, and it, this, this cartoon brought this back to me. They asked me, they used to ask me, Ms. Weingarten, Ms. Weingarten, why do you always wear suits? And you know, I said, because I'm teaching, I'm working. I, why are you asking me the question? And they said, because when you do that, you make us feel important. 11th graders. That's what the cartoon reminded me of. Not being mad about it or on and on. It reminded me of my kids. It reminded me of what kids see in teachers. And frankly, that's what more and more of us in education should be reminded of all the time when we hear things about who our kids are and what they do and what we mean towards to them. And part of that then gets me to teachers. Why do teachers need a union? We often talk, and, and I am sure that people in this room have said this a lot, Teachers are the most important, we now say, in-school factor, right? The most important in-school factor in education. Whether that's right or not, thank God we have Susan Moore Johnson and all of you to do this research. But regardless of whether we are the most important in-school factor, regardless of whether the relationships are more important than the curriculum, all this other stuff, this is what's so remarkable to me. We talk about how important teachers are, and then at the next breath, we don't listen to them. What they need, what they aspire to, the tools and conditions they need to do their jobs. That's why teachers need a union. More than anything else, what has happened in the last few months is that people get that collective bargaining is about voice. It's about listening. It's about having a voice. It's about being able to say, this is what I need to do my job. This is what I need to live. It's about, 
on a macro level, this is what regular working people need to be able to actually partake in the American dream again, to actually think about the American dream as in our future, not in our past. I often say about kids that our job is to help them not simply dream their dreams, but achieve them. So that's what the purple suit and that picture reminded me of. And I think about the wonkiness, because I think about how does all this kind of work with a theory of action and a theory of reform. So what we bring to bear when we think about the voices of teachers, we think about, and our work is informed by, the real life experiences of the front line. And that's what, in some ways, informs this theory of action. And it's about fourfold. And you'll have to excuse me if I talk about it in non-pedagogical and non-legalese language. Number one, quality, 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 quality. And in some ways, and Andy Stern has started saying this um, of late as well, in some ways, what the union movement needs to be about, and I would say what schools need to be about, is quality. What we as a union movement need to be about is about trying to make sure, on a macro and a micro level, we raise up the economic dignity, economic growth of working folk in the United States and the world. And in fact, when there was tremendous union density, we had the halcyon days of the middle class. But as public sector unions, as teacher unions, sorry, as teacher unions, our job is one step further, which is to ensure the quality of the services that we deliver. So whether we're teachers, whether we're, I love this, the folk who actually make sure our water and our food is safe, something that now people think about a lot because of Japan. We happen to represent a lot of those folks in Montana, the folk that make sure the water is safe. But the point is, that's part of our job. Not simply negotiating terms and conditions, salaries and benefits, but ensuring that the quality of the work we do, the quality of teaching, is the best that it can be. And so ultimately, we've spent a lot of time thinking about the preparation, the support, and even the evaluation of teachers. And we actually, even though this is not the exact way you do this, we focused on evaluation because it's a lever for change in school systems. It's something that we and administration, if there are resources, should be able to do something about. The old administration has done a lot about evaluation for all these years, or not done something about evaluation for all these years. And so we said, instead of complaining about it anymore, let's do something about it. And so we believe you can't make a thorough and objective decision about a teacher's qualifications without a valid evaluation system. And so as Susan said, we've done about two or three things in this regard. And there are some people in the room who've worked with us on this, and I thank you very much for doing that. First, we laid out some frameworks. And I'm going to embarrass Susan, because she was at one of our meetings about this. And she said she was actually at several of our meetings about this. And some of us were saying, OK, we're going to do a model. And Susan said, do not do a model. Now, I've never actually heard Susan that directive. Do frameworks. Let Put things out that then kind of force people to really localize the work, to really make it their own. And that's exactly what we did in January of 2010. We put together frameworks for evaluation, both that focus on practice as well as on student learning. Of course, the only thing most of you probably heard was Weingarten said test scores were OK in evaluation. But then we knew that you know if you just do this theoretically and not on the road, it's not going to mean something. And I can tell you with great pride that there's over 100 districts right now 
with their local unions that are really grappling with these frameworks and trying to make them real. And the, since that point, we thought we had enough confidence to then align the due process system, as Susan talked about, and also align it not just in terms of performance, but also in terms of misconduct. And now we happen to be working with the Superintendents Association, Dan Dominich, to see if we can bring our work together. So it will be teacher, union, and superintendents moving this forward. And frankly, if we do this right, if we have a comprehensive evaluation system, as we are talking about, that is multiple measured. That is about both practice and learning. That also gives people help if they're not cutting it. And then quickly, if they're still not cutting it, ushers them out of the profession. If we do that, you're never going to hear the debate about tenure or seniority again. And we can finally actually get back to the debate about what are the steps that we need to do to ensure that we change schools from this industrial model that we're in to a model of creating knowledge knowers. So number one is quality. Number two, or you can even say this is part of number one, you'll hear me say this again, over and over again. We can't do this alone. And maybe it was informed by my experiences as a teacher, or maybe it was informed by the thousands of conversations I've had with teachers. Teachers hate two things. They hate a test prep driven curriculum. Frankly, it's a lot easier than actually doing a real curriculum, but they hate it because they know it's not good for kids. And number two, they hate having to make it up themselves every single day and stay up to the wee hours of the morning trying to figure out how you're going to make rich and alive five different preparations every day. That's on top of taking money out of your pocket to play, buy supplies and these days to buy food for kids. So when we start talking about things like common standards, we have to also talk about the curriculum and the professional development and the work, including the time, that goes around making that real. We were blown away about Singapore. Susan just talked about the International Summit. Do you know in Singapore, teachers work together for up to 20 hours a week, paid school time to talk amongst themselves? Now I tease about it, about talk amongst themselves, because people outside of our profession think that's what it is. They don't see it as real work. We're probably the only profession where they don't see all of this, the stuff we do to wee hours of the night, as real work. Now, in football, people see that. Sorry, I had to use a football analogy. I mean, do, does anybody really, pre-lockout, think that football players really only work for the period of time that they are on the field that Sunday or Saturday or Monday or Tuesday or whatever day, or basketball players? So the next piece that's either part of quality or my next point, equity, is that we need to have real curriculum that's robust and engaging for kids. And it shouldn't simply be the responsibility of teachers to make it up every single day. Number two, after quality. Equity, 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 equity. Now, the only thing that's making me very, very concerned about the future is not the polarization and not the demonization, um, the meaning that goes on with teachers these days. What makes me really nervous is the withdrawal of the investment in education. And that the demonization and the delegitimization and the dehumanizing is enabling that withdrawal of investment. At the very same time as the gap between rich and poor has never been larger, the very same time as child poverty has never been greater in the United States, at the very same time as we have more segregation in our schools than ever before. We can't just say the kids with the least should get the most. 
we have to actually do something about it and can't simply think that it's going to be up to the individual teacher alone to do that. So whether it is a focus on things like, and I think what Grad Nation is doing these days is terrific in terms of focus on the dropout factories and how we turn that around, which is not just instruction, but about wraparound services and other kinds of services, whether it's about what Jeff Canada does in Harlem or about what the school district does in Cincinnati or what the school district does in Syracuse. The notion of having wraparound services has to be immutable, has to be part of our educational strategy. And what I mean by that is whether it's health care or social services or after school services or keeping schools open on the weekend so we can have GED programs for parents, whether it's early childhood, which you know yields an investment of every dollar we spend in early childhood, we yield the investment of $7 later. Equity, equity, equity. Three, accountability needs to be shared. I am reminded of what Hillary Clinton used to say about it takes a village. But at the end of the day, we have to have a different accountability system than the system we have right now. And it's pretty funny that just this week, the President of the United States of America said this. He said to a group of Hispanic students that tests are boring and we need to have a more engaged curriculum. And just two weeks ago, his Secretary of Education said that on the present course that we're on, 82% of schools will be viewed as failures that says more about the current accountability system under No Child Left Behind than about schools. Having said that, the kind of accountability system we need is shared and 360. Accountability should be thought as a tool to improve schools, not a blunt instrument to punish schools and teachers. And accountability has to involve more than test scores. And that's why I call it 360 degree accountability system, a check and balance self-enforcing system. That, has, that considers factors like school safety, orderliness, student discipline, adequacy of resources, and richness of curriculum. And as I said, it has to flow both ways. Now, the last piece of this theory of action is something that you have heard me and others talk about a lot. And as someone who has fought for most of the 25 years that I've been involved in the labor movement, it is probably a little funny that I have become a fighter for collaboration. And I think about, and we have to think about making collaboration and teamwork the new normal. Now, I'm not talking about collaboration for collaboration's sake. But at the end of the day, if we're trying to figure out how to move not just some schools but all schools in order to help all kids, not just some kids, to be knowledge knowers, and we're moving from the industrial model that we have right now, including industrial contracts, to a knowledge model. How are we going to do this if we don't work with the people who are closest to kids and we don't work with kids' parents? How are we going to be able to create trust that enables risk-taking and innovation? I have never seen a school that works that's competitive or competitive. I'm not saying that people are not competitive within each other or within and with each other. But I've never, the only schools that I see work are schools that build in this climate of trust. And the only districts that I see work do this. And we see this in the competitors that compete with us and beat us. Finland, Singapore, Canada, the international countries that Bob was talking about before. When collaboration trumps conflict, it creates conditions for teaching and learning. It drives reform. It's self-enforcing in terms of people working together as a team to push the mission of the institution. I'm not saying it's easy, but I am saying it is essential. And what we've seen, my friends, is this. You saw it, for those of you who were at the um, conference in Denver, 
Bob talked about the conference we just had in New York on international, um, the International Summit. The conference in Denver was actually more important because what it did was it showed and presented 12 districts that were doing whole district change, not one school change, not one classroom change, but whole district change using the theory of collaboration. And they were doing different things. Some of them were focusing on low-performing schools. Some of them were focusing on aligning their compensation system. Some of them were focusing on evaluation. But the point was they were doing and moving the needle for all schools in the district, not just one or two, and not doing it by simply firing teachers, closing and redesigning, or a system of sanctions and penalties. Whole district change requires changing our theory of action to collaboration from conflict. Now, the best piece of this, and this is where research and evidence works and is so important. I do love talking about Washington these days because sometimes Washington feels like an evidence-free zone. <laughs> no, Harvard doesn't, but sometimes Washington does. But this theory is embraced by many of the world's highest performing countries. Finland, Singapore. I've been to Finland. It's amazing what you see in schools. Canada, Ontario which has a very similar um, demographic to some of our districts around the country. These countries are held up as shining models, but they do the kinds of things that we're advocating right now. They prepare teachers, for example, like we prepare doctors. Finland and Singapore make sure that kids get out of college preparation debt-free. Could you imagine the freedom that that gives a student? And no wonder that you have lots of people flocking to colleges of preparation. And all these countries make sure that the stature of teachers is as high as it is low in this country. What was really amazing about the summit on teaching, the international summit, is not until the press conference with the New York Press Corps, did you hear the words, last in, first out, or bad teachers? Nor did they talk about shifting all responsibility to teachers. Instead, they talked about collective responsibility. They talked about teachers having a voice. They are closest to the kids, as I've talked about before and as Bob talked about before. And What's interesting is that we see some of this, as I just said, in our own country, right down the street at your neighboring Ivy League city, New Haven, Connecticut. That contract has been recognized universally as a national model. Now, I'm not too keen about ever looking at something as a silver bullet. But this is what that contract does and what it has done. It built wages, benefits, and the groundwork. But what it did was it also gave teachers voices in a number of decisions when New Haven had not done that before. It did a whole bunch of things of agree to agree, which people actually scoffed at initially, saying, oh, they're just going to sit there and in committee, and then they're going to meet and have another committee meeting, and then another committee meeting. Does that sound like a faculty conference? <laughs> but what they did is they actually met all their deadlines before the deadline, because they created trust within, and within each other and a sense of mission that they had to accomplish it. They have a new evaluation system. They're, they're pilot testing right now that goes into operation for all teachers in September, and it is a multiple measured system, not just test scores, but multiple measured that includes test scores. What's most important is that the contract has been a catalyst for public confidence in, and maybe I shouldn't say this is most important, What's important, what's most important is what happens for kids. But the contract has been a catalyst for what's called the New Haven Promise, a plan with Yale University, I'm not suggesting that Harvard does this, 
that make sure the college is accessible and affordable for every New Haven public school student who attends school regularly has a certain GPA and a certain attendance. And Yale President Richard Levin credited this AFT New Haven contract for helping make that program possible. And the university has noted over and over again that the top-down reform doesn't work. And he wanted to see, it's a great third-party validator, teacher buy-in. What it's also done is created public confidence in New Haven about public education. And it's been a model, that contract plus the AFT proposal on evaluation and tenure. It's been a model now for the Connecticut legislature. The legislature is considering right now, as so many others are, our overhaul of teacher evaluation and create a new model of evaluation. And our affiliate, the Connecticut American Federation of Teachers, has proposed that model, which many legislators now want to see as the template in Connecticut. Now, this is not the only example. Two days ago in San Francisco, I made a speech about how to use collective bargaining not to transform schools, per se, but how to use it to help affect the horrible budget situations we've had. And a school district, Bayshore, Long Island, Bayshore, Long Island, they told me that they have not had a layoff or a cut in direct services to children in the last two years when New York has severely cut budgets and their property taxes in Bayshore have been severely stretched. And they do it by working together by scrutinizing every single spending decision they have. ABC School District in LA County, 20 miles down from LA. The union president and superintendent meet weekly. The members of the union's executive board and the superintendent's cabinet now meet weekly. Now this is happening in school after school after school. The union and district co-sponsor parent nights and professional development conferences. And in, in fact, they actually started the work that we are now doing nationally on our anti-bullying camp, anti campaign, See a Bully, Stop a Bully. What has happened there, every single year, you see leaps and bounds in student achievement, even with the problems that California has had in its budgets. I can go on and on. Baltimore, Pittsburgh, Hillsborough County, Florida, elsewhere, using collective bargaining and this collaboration model to create problem-solving contracts that bring real reforms to schools and use quality, equity, shared responsibility with collaboration. Now, why is this so important right now? Because there is a tale of two cities right now or a tale of two competing ideologies. And you see this all over the country. You see it in Ohio, you see it in Wisconsin, you see it, um, I'm sure, in these halls. Instead of a theory of systemic transformation, there are people that are very focused and believe very much in the ideology of the market approach as it pertains to schools. Frankly, I've been reading a new book, which is not so new called The Cult of Efficiency by Ray Callahan about how this theory was in operation in the 1920s. It didn't do very well then, and I would say it doesn't do very well now, and why? Because it doesn't focus on changing a system. It focuses on having a competing system, not changing a system not making the system change so that all kids become knowledge knowers with a fixation on helping those with the least. But I'm going to end on evidence. Ideology or ideology is ideology. What about the evidence? And it's been pretty interesting that charter schools have been around for 20 years. And I'm going to say this very clearly. I started three charter schools. One of them is doing exceptionally well. Al Shanker talked about charters as incubators, as a laboratory. But let's look at the research. 
A major study by Stanford University showed that more than 83% of students in charter schools did worse or no better than their demographically matched peers in regular public schools. And on performance pay, that's not differentiated pay based on how you need to move schools ahead like they're doing in Baltimore, but simply paying people a lot more if their kids get a good score on a standardized test, or even the school-based bonuses that I negotiated. Vanderbilt University said that merit pay does not improve student outcomes. It was a pretty intense study. The study by Ron Fryer right now on something Joe Klein and I negotiated said it didn't work. So the bottom line is, we need to actually follow the evidence, whether it be the evidence from Massachusetts, Maryland, New Haven, Connecticut, Baltimore, ABC School District, or the evidence from Finland, Canada, Singapore. Performance always matters. Performance is really important. But so are the steps to ensure that, the preparation, the support, and the evaluation of teachers that's fundamentally based on continuous improvement as opposed to simply gotcha or sorting. Respect really matters. The things I just talked about, quality, equity, shared responsibility, collaboration, really matter. And the last thing that really matters, and I'm going to quote from Andreas Schleicher, who oversees PISA, the International Achievement Test, who said when he was reporting that the top performing nations on PISA recruit only top performing college graduates for teaching positions, support them with mentoring and other help, and take steps to raise respect for the profession. And he concluded that teaching in the United States is no longer a high status profession. It's never been a high wage profession but it's no longer a high status profession. And we can only improve that through better recruiting, better pay, better training, and a change in the tone in this country. A change, by the way, that doesn't create cost a dime in order to change that tone. I would submit to all of you, did I just sound like a lawyer? Sorry. <laughs> that we got to weave ourselves off of the silver bullets the magic potion, the saying, as long as we fire our way, we'll get to a great school system. As long as we close a number of schools, we'll get to a great school system. As long as we have a number of charters, we'll get to a great school system. As long as we have some vouchers, we'll get to a great school system. As long as we create that competition, we'll get to a great school system. Let's actually transform our whole system. Let's actually look and see what works. Let's figure out if we can actually first sustain that and then replicate it, and let's use collective bargaining, the voice of teachers, as a mechanism by which we help transform schools so that once and for all, we can promise this generation of kids, not just my kids that saw me in that purple suit, but this generation of kids going forward, that they will not simply dream their dreams but achieve them, and we will help all of them become the knowledge knowers they need to become today and tomorrow. Thank you very much, everybody. Okay, if you could pass your questions to the center, and um, we'll start that process. I, I thought I might uh, just kick this off with a follow-up of a question from an earlier session today, and that is the the fact that many new teachers either are, seem to be agnostic about the value of unions or are not quite sure they want to be represented by unions and the struggle that, that unions uh, and their leaders often have in, in uh, winning over new teachers. That may shift with Wisconsin and Ohio and a lot of uh, other kind of anti-teacher anti-union activity, but I, I was just curious what, what kinds of comments you might have about that, Randy. Well, I, you know, I think that it's interesting because 
I hear that comment a lot, um, but I don't see it a lot. Now, maybe I'm not in the places that um, other people hear it and see it, but even in every, when I was the president of the Teachers Union in New York City, we used to poll, because it was so big, even though I, was, I tried to be in three schools a week, um, when you have 1,500 schools, how many, how many schools do they have now, Bob? 1,700. 1,700. Um, that's Bob Hughes from New Visions. When you have that many schools, you can't get to every one of your members. Um, but we used to poll um, new teachers all the time, and we used to meet with them all the time. And what you'd see after the first year is a huge increase in people understanding why they needed their union. And we saw that in the ed sector poll in the last few years, that over the course of the last 10 years, they did a poll, I think, 10 years ago, and they did a poll the last two years, um, more and more new teachers see that they need a union because they need a voice. And a collective voice tends to be better than an individual voice for people that do not have power. Now, I've actually spent some time with um, uh, Teach for America. I was at their 20th anniversary. And I spent a lot of time at one of their panels. And I got a, a whole bunch of good feedback afterwards in terms of what Teach for America folks were saying, what other new, folk, new teachers are saying. And, and our obligation as a union movement, and, and I actually could thank Scott Walker for being the mobilizer in chief <laughs> now, because I didn't think he has actually um, helped hugely in this regard with his extremism. Um, but I think that, that um, our obligation as a union is to listen to new teachers, hear what they are saying, because ultimately a union is about the democratic representation of all of your members. And so it's not about all of your senior members, it's not about all of your not so senior members, it's about all of your members. And so we need to do a better job of listening and making sure that we are relevant um, and not an insurance company. Just, you know, we're there when you need it. We need to be an activist mobilizing organization. And, and so what's happened with Wisconsin and Ohio and Florida and Indiana and Idaho and Tennessee and Maine and New Hampshire is that people are seeing that they need their unions. I don't know if you've actually saw the Paul Krugman talked about this a couple of days ago. The professor, the professor from uh, yeah. um, Wisconsin, yeah. Cronin, raised some issues. Someone we represent raised some issues, and immediately all of his emails have been foiled. Regular people need a union because regular people are not going to be able to fight these fights individually and alone. So here's a question. We have enough to keep her here through the night, so we won't get to all of these. But what are the biggest barriers to effective district union collaboration that you were describing? Um, the biggest barrier, um, I think, is twofold. One, an unwillingness to do it. And two, a fear of doing it. And the fear of doing it is that the first time somebody gets up and says, you're in bed with the union or you're in bed with management. Now this is like, I've heard this many times. You're a sellout, you're in bed, on and on and on. And that is, and your obligation is to actually convince people as to why it's important. But we also have to, that obligation on a national level. Meaning, if people think that fighting is going to get them on the front pages of a national magazine, that makes it cool. If people think that working together is going to be celebrated, that becomes cool. And so part of this has to be what is our obligation on a national level or in you know, places like Harvard or Yale or Cornell or others to actually talk about this as an important vehicle of transformation. So here's a different kind of question. Can you describe the staff you work with most closely and your leadership style with them? 
Um, why don't you actually ask them that well, question? I, was, <laughs> I think they'd love to hear your perspective on that, Randy. <laughs> we actually have some AFT staff here, so they're listening closely. First off, they are incredible. The staff of the AFT is incredible. And some of them are here right now. You know some of them. I see Rob Weil. I see Jason here. I see uh, Ruth Ann here. I see others. And I also see some of our leaders from um, around the country. Um, I see our folks from the uh, um, Massachusetts Federation of Teachers and from the Boston Teachers Union. So, but I am a hard charging <laughs> boss. Um, the one, they're all laughing. Um, <laughs> the one thing that I think they would say to you and that I try to do is I never expect more of anybody else than I expect from myself. And when we talk about high expectations, I expect high expectations. But the issue is also, can you give people the support and the wherewithal they need and want to do their jobs? And so the notion of talking and collaborating and things like that, I try to do. But I have very high expectations. And we are very hard charging. And you know, sometimes it's tough. but. Um, I would say that the AFT staff has risen to the occasion. Okay. There's an assumption embedded in this question, so you can challenge that. And Why did if you, you need to talk to them, I'll get out of the room and Rob will uh, <laughs> tell you whether I'm right or wrong. Why did you support mayoral control in New York? That's a really um, good question right now. <laughs> <laughs> I hope Michael Bloomberg is listening. So we supported it for a couple of reasons. Number one, if you actually looked um, back at what was going on in New York City at the time, um, not, we had just finished a Giuliani regime. I know this feels like so long ago. Um, somebody just said it's not. <laughs> But more important than that, and if you've actually read Diane, His uh, Diane Ravitch's books, um, not simply the last one, but several of them beforehand, the New York City school system has gone from various different forms of governance. And let me just say, I think governance models are less important than what I just talked about. I think people focus on governance models as a silver bullet. And you see local, con local school districts um, doing extraordinarily well and doing extraordinarily poorly. You see mayoral control districts, most of them these days not doing well for one major reason, lack of transparency and lack of um, checks and balances. But the reason we supported it was because community control, as it had then um, been defined, not as was its original vision, was not working. What was happening was that there was no confidence in the public education system, and we were not getting the funding that we needed. We had a case at the same time, the CFE case, which essentially feels null and void these days, given the last two budget cuts. But we had not had enough um, confidence in the public school systems or enough mayoral accountability in the system when the mayor, since 1975, totally and completely controlled the public fisc. So the mayor kept on getting to say, I have no control, when the mayor had total and complete responsibility of the money and made it clear that he had total complete res We haven't had a female mayor. That's why I'm saying he made it totally clear about that. Now, this last time, there were several more checks and balances that were written into the law, including having a fixed um, end of the law, and I suspect that given the fact that Mayor Bloomberg is being perceived as having abused his power, that law is going to change and change fundamentally. Because when somebody gets that kind of power and abuses it, it will change when it expires at the end of this, um, the next four years, I think. Professional organizations often play a role in raising the bar for entry into the teaching profession. Um, think of the AMA in the medical profession. What uh, role might the AFT play in this area in the years ahead? 
So I actually said it the wrong way in 2004, um, but I, as a local leader in 2004, said we should be policing our own profession. Now, policing is the wrong word, but we want, and, and, and we said that about tenure, we said that about a whole bunch of other things. We, in the American Federation of Teachers, with the NEA and others, actually tried to form the National Board for Teaching Standards, actually have tried to work with NCATE as ways of trying to um, um, uh, do these kinds of things. But I would foresee, and, and I'm not intending to make any news here, I would foresee if we had the wherewithal, we'd want to take more and more steps in the preparation, support, reduction, mentoring um, of, of teachers and do so um, with many more partners, whether they be university partners or whether they be partners um, in school systems throughout the country. Mm -hmm. um, from the we also, by the way, support a higher threshold in terms of tenure, making sure that people in a higher entry level threshold, because it is profoundly, it's really profoundly unfair to people if you think about it. And I teased about it beforehand when I said, you know, the newest thing I think about teaching is not just throw the teachers the keys and have the Nike commercial and say, do it. I now start thinking about teachers, or, or the way people think about teachers as speed dating. You know, plop them in. If you don't like them, just usher them out. And it's just profoundly unfair. And we have to actually have some real standards. I know we have the California's teaching standards and others, but some real standards for the profession and a real fidelity in meeting them. Um, and, and those are some of the things we've thought about as well. Um, you've talked about evaluation. What do you think is the explanation for the fact that so many teachers are not evaluated regularly? Um, so two explanations. One, so should I do the nice one or the bad one first? One, principals don't have the time to do it. Is that the nice one? That's yeah. the nice one. Yeah. <laughs> Two, many principals don't know how to do it. Because, and so, and much of the evaluation systems in the United States of America are simply observational snapshots. Now, how many teachers or former teachers are in this audience? So you would be, it, the, the notion of the drive-by evaluation or observation would not be unfamiliar to you or the test-driven observation evaluation. So, and I, and I said this, I think, I don't remember, was it um, earlier in your class or at the Kennedy School? But, but, you know, if you think about evaluation, and I think about it, sorry, this is my second football analogy, as the football game tape. I think about the football game tape in terms of how football, not only players, but football teams, spend a lot of time focusing both on individual as well as group performance. And group performance is essential in terms of winning. Teamwork is essential, but what do they do? They constantly look at their performance through game tapes or through training tapes. And, and, they, and they deconstruct everything. We never do that. This is what we do. A principal comes in or assistant principal comes in or a vice principal or whatever that are called dependent upon district. Once a year, once every three years, six times a year, and basically sits there for 20 minutes or 30 minutes, and then you get the feedback maybe a week or two weeks or six months later. That's not an, that's not an evaluation. Now, what principals will tell you is they don't have the time. But What's happened is that the union gets tagged with this when a lot of the evaluation systems have been management driven. Now, having said that, that's why we're stepping into the breach. And so instead of complaining about it anymore, we said, let's figure out how to do this in a way that's both observational, um, you know, informed by data, uh, a peer component, I believe that that would be really, really important, as well as some self-reflection. 
Okay. Um, from your perspective as a union leader, what if, quote, what regular working people need, unquote, comes into conflict with what children need? What, which needs take priority? So I actually reject the premise of the question. Okay. And the reason I reject the premise of the question is because I have actually, I, I am sure that somebody can find some example somewhere where there's a conflict. But you could also find that same conflict between parent and children. And you could also find that same conflict in any number of other fields. And I hear this all the time. And ultimately, what it's intended to do is to divide teachers from kids. And it's a defend, de, 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 intended, I get so angry about this one. It's intended so that um, you don't, so that, you, so that people um, demean or denigrate teachers and their unions. I would say 90% of the time, teachers and children's interests are pretty much aligned. Now, as a school system, if they're, not if they're not aligned and if there is a conflict, the school system has to go with what the child's needs are. That's the system's responsibility. Our responsibility is to try to keep them in alignment virtually as much of the time as possible. What we have to do is we have to focus on that alignment and that mission, and we also have to make sure that we focus on fairness. OK. Um, what do you see as the role of, I think it means the appropriate role, of value-added measures in evaluating individual teachers or whole schools? So I think with value-add, and I don't know if Tom Kane is here tonight, but I think with value-add, the more we know, the more concerned we are about it. Because if it's, so what value-add is, is it is a prediction, it's an assumption. It's kind of like how many people did the bet? Is, is gambling legal in Massachusetts? I don't remember. How many people bet on the, um, somebody, thank God, one of my friends from the Boston's Teachers Union saying, no, don't ask this question. How many people <laughs> bet on the, you know, on the college basketball championships? and did the brackets. Everyone in this room. Yes. Everybody, right? <laughs> Come on, everybody. So, you know, a value-add prediction would have had Kansas in the finals based upon a whole bunch of different assumptions. But last I looked, they weren't, right? So it's a prediction. It's an assumption based upon a whole bunch of things. Now. Sometimes it's credible data, and sometimes it's not credible data. There's a whole lot of reasons why Kansas would have been in the finals, based on a lot of credible data. But it wasn't this time. So it's, you know, does it have a role? Yes, it has a role. Does it, is it, you know, the, the, um, the, you know, the tablets from Mount Sinai? No. Okay. Um, uh, these are kind of related, so let me... Um just put both of them out. You can answer both or one. What would be different in the challenges we face if we didn't have local control of 15,000 school districts in the U.S.? And another question, perhaps related, most schools in the USA are funded with property taxes. Do you see a better, more equitable source of funding? Oh, boy. Um, look, of course there's a better, more equitable source of funding. <laughs> And the real question is, will we ever get there? I mean, the, the, the problem for us in education is that we have to fly the plane and build it at the same time, regardless of whether we have nirvana situations or not. Now, I'll take my own personal situation. I grew up in Rockland County, New York, Clarkstown, New York. Our schools were funded by property taxes. Our schools were amazing. We wanted for nothing. And the Clarkstown schools at that time were viewed as you know, one of the best in, Rock, in New York State. When I first started teaching in the early 90s in New York City, we had to scavenge for chalk. It was not a property tax system. It was an income tax system, but it was a dependent school district. 
um, there was there um, the per basis per capita for child was um, many thousands of dollars less than it was at Clarkstown at that moment. The textbooks still had John Kennedy and Clinton. My recollection is was president at the time. Um, we had to, you know, this is before the CFE suit was brought. The union brought a suit on the habitability of the schools and making the schools and, and making sure the schools, um, we, we used the theory of landlord tenancy and we said, if homes should be habitable, shouldn't the schools? And, you know, because of all the, I mean, it was just disgusting what was going on in the schools at that time. So, you know, the, so when you have a property tax base system, what happens is that wealth drives the system. So then you have things like ESEA and states like doing at the Abbott case or the CFE case in New York to try to balance that. But equity considerations are incredibly important. And if we want to actually eradicate poverty, or if we want to actually help all kids um, achieve, we have to focus on ways of fixing this. And whether it's, you know, but, but I have not seen a state with all the finance cases we've been able to do, have, I've not seen a state then say, okay, I can fix the property tax system. So my request is, if we can't fix it directly, we have to fix it indirectly enough so we give those kids with the least the most. What changes are you recommending in ESEA? <laughs> it's a quick one. Um, we're, look, we know that there's a bunch of, there's a, a push to do it really quickly. And it'd be nice to get it right this time. Um, so obviously we're recommending the accountability system get changed. I think everybody is now recommending the accountability system get changed. But we also, if we go back to a system where there's no accountability, that would be a real problem. Now, I'm going to say that again because this is a teacher's union that is saying that. If we see a system that, and, and you know, a lot of people are starting to like that the Republicans are saying, oh, good, go back to total and complete flexibility. But we also have to have the resources attached to it. And this is a pretty tough time to try to get resources from the federal government. And we also have to have a system that is not simply about sanctions, but it's about also some supports and incentives to create those supports. So um, yes, we should be focusing on, um, the, um, on, on turning around um, struggling schools. Yes, we have to change the accountability system. Yes, we, should, we think we should have 360 degree accountability. We should also have some incentives and supports in there as well. Okay. Uh, the teacher's salary schedule in most districts is largely weighted on the back end with salary increases and in pensions, that is for more senior teachers. What are your thoughts on the role that this deferred compensation approach plays in attracting young teachers who don't plan to be career-long teachers? So, um, again, this is going to surprise people. We need to have far more competitive pay for all teachers. And if we could conflate that salary schedule right now so that people could actually get it faster, that would be the best thing in life. Mm -hmm. The only reason that it goes the way it goes is that's how people could negotiate it. Because, and so then it became the, you know, the law of the land. But that's how people could say, okay, get a little now and then a little bit more and then a little bit more. And, you know, and, and, and uh, so, you know, we tried many times to actually conflate the salary schedule in New York City. And it got extended because that was the only way we could get money um, introduced in it. Now, look at what just happened in Baltimore. Baltimore has actually fundamentally changed its salary schedule and where they've um, created much more rapid advance and they've created differentiated pay based upon career ladders and things like that. In terms of pensions, this is a bigger 
and fundamental question for the United States of America, which is what is going to happen in 10 years from now when no one has a defined benefit pension? And you know, my friends in Massachusetts are one of the states that actually don't get Social Security, correct? Am I correct about that? So all they have is the defined benefit pension. And this will actually surprise you. The average pension, the only reason I know this is because I used it in a speech on Monday. I normally don't carry these facts and figures in my head. The average pension of the 7.7 million retired local and state government workers in 2008 was about $22,000. So you do the math in terms of what that is for a week. And a fourth of them don't get Social Security, Texas, Massachusetts, California. Um, and most of them, three quarters of public employees actually pay into their pensions. So the real question becomes, what do we do in America when people have no retirement security? Frankly, I think we should actually be building up retirement security instead of taking it away from the last people that have it. We need to actually start building it up to ensure that people have it. Because when they have it, they're not impoverished in retirement. We don't have, someone told me, the not ready to retire folk in their 70s and their 80s who are now working at Walmart because they can't afford retirement. So, it's, so, so we actually at the AFT just, um, and our, our, um, our um, executive council is going to be considering it in May, but we had this ad hoc committee that looked at all of these pension issues. And we did actually suggest, we, we suggested keeping the defined benefit system. But we also suggested a whole bunch of other things, including universal coverage, um, real portability, so people can take things with them, a whole bunch of other things, shared responsibility, where everybody would have to contribute. And we made, we suggested several reforms to the current defined benefit plan, including no spiking, no double dipping, and to actually cap the employer portion on the defined benefit part of the pension. So, and you know, we did this with lots of people who were trustees from around the country, as well as several executive council members, um, and also made a proposal to actually use the capital, assuming that it's done in a fiduciarily sound way, use the capital that are in these defined benefit plans, $3 trillion of assets throughout this country. Use it for infrastructure development. Use it for job creation. You know, use this kind of work capital so that we can actually put people back to work because after all, if we put people back to work, then we're going to have a very different America than we have right now. Okay. I'm a former UFT and CSA member of New York City Department of Education. One of the biggest challenges I faced as both a teacher and a principal is an ongoing lack of support and professional development for ELL and special ed teachers and students. What role do you think the union should play? In, I'm sorry, in ensuring teach, that teachers receive the training development to educate learners with special needs. Look, we have to constantly play as big a role as we can because who else is going to play the role to help teachers um, help support kids? And it would be nice if we could be like um, many of our international competitors who, and I know I've said this before, who outcompete us in terms of what they do, in terms of preparation and support. Um, but you know, when we can't, we have to actually do it alone and help, help um, teachers throughout this country. And you know, uh, so sometimes we don't do enough. Um, sometimes that's, a, um, that's because of the resource issues within our own unions and because of the you know, competing needs. But um, we should do as much as we can. You know, and that it is in this question, but in Finland, the attrition rate of teachers is negligible. In America, the attrition rate is between 30 and 50% still for the first three to five years at a cost 
to school systems of about $7.3 billion a year. And at one point or another, you know, we could actually save a bunch of money and actually keep people as they're doing a better and better job if we supported them more. Looking ahead, distance learning and digital media might circumvent traditional schools, yielding performances that are indistinguishable from or even better than those attained in the public schools. As a union leader uh, in education, how do you think about this issue? So I've heard this a lot. Um, the School of One in New York, which I have not yet seen. Um, the virtual learning centers that are happening in Florida at great profit making to individual entrepreneurs. And, you know, do, does technology have a role in education? Of course. Should we be looking at some hybrid models? Of course. Um, I saw some when I was in Israel in December and, um, you know, what we're seeing, and you saw Today in the New York Times, there was a big um, headline about as the city of New York is contemplating laying off 6,000 teachers, they have hugely increased their budget for um, technology and computerization. But let me say this. Anybody who knows anything about teaching and about its students should absolutely and totally reject this idea as craven, stupid, and awful. <laughs> and the reason I say this is, look at, That's a good question. not that hybrid models are not, but, but think about the proposition here, that a computer can replace the relationship between teacher and student. David Brooks actually has said this better than I, that the key in the, the key in teaching is the relationship. It's a people profession. Kids are too anonymous now. They're totally focused on those machines now. Why would we want to do more of that? We need to figure out ways to engage kids in social exercises with people and to make sure that they feel like adults love them and care about them. So that's why even the underlining proposition of the question just, it doesn't make my blood boil. It's like, oh my God, are we once again going to go into like a Jetsons mode and, you know, have machines replace people? Now, yes, in certain things they can, but not in the relationship in learning. Hindsight is 2020, but were there any indicators of the current polarization around teachers unions three or five years ago? Yes, 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 and yes. And, you know, we were to blame for some of it too. And part of it is, and I, is that, you know, we have to be about quality and we have to be about fairness. And when we saw um, cases, for example, tenure cases that go on for months and months and months, we should have stepped up more to say, let's make sure that we speed this up. That we don't, um, that, that in the defense of fairness, we don't actually excuse um, this kind of glacial process. So we were part of this by not being nimble enough to actually call things out when we saw them. Having said that, you know, this is the easy way out. This is when you don't know how to solve a problem, you blame somebody else. And what is really bad about this is blaming teachers and the people who actually give them a voice. And I, I said this at the beginning of, of, of um, my talk tonight. But I find this shocking that we say that teachers, in this country, we say that teachers are so important, but it's like um, we believe that they shouldn't be hurt. You know, we believe that when they ask for something, we should just say, shut up. And that's just wrong. 
If we actually believe they're important, then we should be listening to them and respecting them and helping them do their jobs and helping them live with dignity and respect. And that's what the union movement is supposed to be about. So yes, we were responsible by not um, being focused on how to turn around schools, how to do this, and often what happens is people hear us say, instead of them hearing us say yes, they hear us say, well, this is why we can't do it, as opposed to this is what we need to do it. Um, like even when we talk about things like testing, people or, or, or using test data as part of an evaluation of teachers. What people hear us say is, we don't want to be evaluated on the basis of student learning. That's actually not what teachers are saying. They're saying that this is not fair to have us assume full responsibility for that. So part of it is learning to have a, the same, the same um, language. Part of it is also um, that we weren't nimble enough, but part of it is that it is really hard work to move systems and help all kids and move kids or move systems from industrial model to a knowledge model and not just some kids but all kids. So at the same time as we're trying to you know, turn around low performing schools and help the kids who need the most, we're also trying to move a whole system. That's really hard work. And the easiest way of dealing with really hard work is to blame somebody else. And that is what we have to change. That's the toxic environment we have, particularly now with all the budget cuts. Okay, one more. Um, there's been a lot of rhetoric about professionalizing the teaching career. What do you think is the best way to approach this, and what do you think are the most important levers in making this happen? Um, so, you're not going to be surprised if I say collective bargaining <laughs> is the most important lever, I believe. Um, we need to have some resources. We need to have collective bargaining. We need to have um, people realize that um, time built into schedules so that you can do the mentoring, you can do the induction, you can do the kind of meeting with people and whatever is, is essential work. So resources, I, I hate using the word resources these days because somebody thinks it's a blank check. So I always use resources for some particular purpose. Um, but I think that models of where it's working is very important to replicate. Um, uh, I think that collective bargaining is a huge vehicle to doing it as opposed to state law or federal law. Um, and um, I think that resources to create the time for induction and that um, and mentoring is very important. Okay. Join me in thanking Randy for a really great Thank you, everybody.